I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 is our text. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. If you're at Sweetwater or McCulloch campus, just grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. If you're at our Parker campus, then there's a table right back uh, in the middle of the room. Go back there and grab one of the Bibles and turn to page 966 and you will find Matthew chapter 7. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, uh, it is great to be back with you. I was traveling last week. I got the privilege of preaching in Montana at uh, Emanuel Baptist Church in Billings, Montana. And uh, can I just tell you that the weather is a little bit cooler there? And uh, that's not why I went. I went as, on an invitation to come and lead their staff retreat, and I got a chance to to fellowship with a uh, sister church that uh, God is working in and doing great things, and, and, but it is so good to be home. Uh, you know, I, I told them they might be my second favorite church now, but uh, Calvary is uh, number one by far. And I just love being home. I love worshiping with uh, our team. I love the fact we have one church in three locations and seven services and all of that uh, that's going on. And one of the things I really love is the way that Calvary serves its communities. Calvary serves the, the people of Lake Havasu and Parker, and, and that's because we want to connect with them, and, and that's why I'm excited about things like Rachel's Challenge. I really hope that you will, you know, give a day. Just give a day and give some time and bless people. And, and, and as I like to put it, it's so easy for older people to complain about the next generation, that young kids and all that kind of stuff. How about instead of complaining, we do something redemptive, and we step into their lives and we bless them for a day. How about that? What a, what a great way to counter uh, just the, the, all the, the people who, who don't see the hope that, uh, that we do. And uh, what a great way to invest in the next generation and remind them that they are loved and cared for. Uh, even if we can't attach Jesus with that, he'll show up. And, and another way that, uh, that God keeps opening doors because we serve our community is tomorrow night, uh, which for most of you is going to be Sunday. Uh, so I'll just go this way, Sunday night. So the campuses get that too. Sunday night, uh, our Alpha ministry here at Calvary is going to be on the radio. They have, uh, they have partnered with KNTR, and actually KNTR is sponsoring them and, and uh, giving them this airtime. And they, at 5 o'clock on Sunday nights for the next 10 weeks, they're going to be doing Alpha radio program. And what that means is they're going to be teaching Alpha. Now, if you don't know what Alpha is, you can sign up for that when we have life group signups. Alpha is a, a, just a ministry that introduces people to Jesus. It talks about the very basics of the Christian faith, very basics of the Christian life. And if so, you can sign up and be in Alpha when we have life group signups starting uh, next week. Or you can tune in to Alpha Radio and listen in and call in and ask questions and support that because this is an opportunity to connect with people who aren't going to show up in our church. And since our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, what better way to do that? So uh, I hope you'll tune in and listen to, to Alpha Radio Sundays at 5 on KNTR the next 10 weeks. We're, gonna, we're praying that God will do amazing things through this ministry. So we're wrapping up our uh, Sermon on the Mount series. We've been talking about upside down, how applying the teachings of Jesus to your life will turn your life upside down for about the last three months. And uh, we're coming to the final text in this, uh, in this study. And, and so uh, to get us started, what is the most foolish thing you've ever done in public? The most foolish thing. I'm talking about capital S stupid. What is that thing that you've done? Now, if you can, share it with the person sitting next to you. We're not going to bring you up here on stage. I'll do that in just a moment. Ready, set, go. You've got 30 seconds. Share. What's that thing you've done that you're really embarrassed that you did it? Of course, statute of limitations have expired, so it's okay to tell them now. Some of you are having a lot of fun doing this. Some of you are like, I've never told anybody about this before, but here you go. All right, so this, this was a long time ago. In fact, uh, for me, the, the foolish thing I've done publicly, I was uh, on a mission trip, first big mission trip I ever led, had a bunch of uh, about 25 students and adults with me. I was in charge at the ripe old age of 23, and, uh, and we'd gone from Scottsdale, Arizona, all the way up to Long Beach, Washington, uh, and some of you actually know where that is, 
And, uh, and I decided to be fun since the, they kept calling the beach a public highway. I thought, well, let's be fun. Let's drive the van on the beach, church van on the beach. Let's do that. And Merelda, who had been my bride for a whole year, said, uh, don't do it. You're going to get stuck if you do it. Don't do it. And did I listen to her? No, I didn't. I said, oh, no, this will be fun. We got on the beach, but when I was leaving the beach, we got stuck. Bury that van up to the axles in sand. Yeah. And there I was, myself, some of the teenagers, and a very, very unhappy wife. So uh, I repented, and uh, I, I listen to her better now uh, most of the time. So, see, the reality is we've all made foolish choices. Every single one of us has. But there is a difference between a momentary lapse in judgment and a foolish life. I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I want to make wise decisions. I, I desperately desire to live a wise life. And I really don't think there are many people who aspire to idiocy. I mean, you may go, I got a cousin, uh, you know. <laughs> but, um, but most of us want to live a wise life, life. And so if we really want to, then let's listen to Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. Again, this is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell and great was the fall of it. So Jesus concludes his Sermon on the Mount with a powerful illustration. One that if applied to our lives will change us dramatically. It'll... it'll make our lives strong, but it, it basically boils down to this. The more you build your life on God's wisdom, the stronger your life will become. Do you get that? The more that you build your life on God's wisdom, the stronger your life is going to become. Isn't that what Jesus just said? Hey, if you want to have a wise life, then build your life on the rock, which means take the words that I've told you, all these things I've taught you, and apply them to your life. If you want to have a foolish life, ignore what I've said, and it'll be like building a house on sand, and when the storms come, it's going to collapse. See, you can understand that. I can understand that. So the question comes down to this. Do you want a successful life? <laughs> this side wants one. How about the rest of you? Do you guys want a successful life? Okay, if you want a successful life, then uh, do what Jesus says. Isn't that what he just told you? You know, if, if you apply it, if you live it, his, his half-brother, the Apostle James, he, he put it this way, be doers of the word and not hearers only, and so deceive yourselves. Be doers of the word, not hearers, because if you're a hearer, you're deceiving yourself and thinking that you're something that you're not. And, and I don't know about you, but my experience in life is that we are much better at hearing than at doing. We are much better at knowing the right things to do than we are at actually doing the right things, right? Like eating healthy. We all know what it means to eat healthy, but do we always eat healthy? You know, I don't. I, I hate eating healthy. Unhealthy tastes better, okay? And people go, well, but you'll die sooner. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to heaven. I... I don't know. Ice cream just calls my name. What can I say? <laughs> we know how to exercise better than we do, right? Because, you know, it's like, yeah, I know I should exercise more, but I don't want to. You know, you're sitting on the couch, you're watching commercials about people exercising, and you go, yeah, I should do that. I'm not going to, but I should. And we know more of God's Word than we apply to our lives. We know so much more than we apply to our lives. And, and, and can I just be honest? Uh, I grew up in churches where 
Bible knowledge was really, really valued. And, and I want you to value knowing God's Word. I mean, I, I give them away. Uh, we want you to read the Bible. We want you to study the Bible. We want you to learn the Bible. We want you to memorize the Bible. Cause we, and we tell you, if you know God's Word, it'll change your life. But, but here's the thing. I, you have to apply it. Because a lot of the churches I grew up in where we, the knowledge was valued, it wasn't lived. It wasn't applied. And, and therefore, it wasn't powerful. And, and this is so simple. Do what Jesus says and your life will be strong. And we need, to, we need to hear him at that and we need to do it because life is stormy. Can I just point that out? I mean, you guys know that. You've lived long enough. You know that there's going to be storms that come. There are no storm-free zones. You're never going to get to that place in life where there's no rain, there's no wind, there's no disasters, there's no floods, there's no earthquakes or hurricanes. Tragedies are going to happen. Evil people are going to happen. Disasters of all kinds are going to happen. And the life that is built on God is going to stand. Now, it will be shaken, messy, damaged, but intact. On the other hand, if you choose the foolish path, if you know God's wisdom and decide you're going to ignore it, you decide you're going to live life your own way instead of God's way, can I encourage you to put on a helmet? Because you're going to crash. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and how much damage is going to happen because the storms are going to come and your life is going to crumble. Okay, so we know this, so let's talk application. How do we build a life on God's Word? How do we take Jesus' words and apply it to our life? Because this, this goes way beyond being religious. This goes way beyond attending church and winning at Bible trivia. And, and, and by the way, this is more than labels. Because a lot of times we apply labels. I'm a Christian. I'm a deacon. I'm a teacher. I'm a pastor. Can I just tell you that God is not impressed with labels? He's impressed with life change. He's not impressed with the, the things we do to try to impress each other. He knows our heart. He knows whether we're applying it, uh, his word to our lives. And if we're applying his word to our lives, it changes us and our lives will stand. So if we want to have this life built on the foundation of God's word that it begins by applying Jesus' teachings to yourself. Apply Jesus' teachings to yourself. Um, in the sermon that Jesus has just preached, he talked extensively about our personal spiritual life, about our souls, and about our choices. I mean, and I'd encourage you to sit down sometime and read chapters 5, 6, and 7 all together because it's one message. But in chapter 5, Jesus talked about our attitudes. He talked about being angry with your brother. He talked about forgiveness. He, he talked about lust and the way our minds function. In chapter 6, he talked about prayer and fasting and generosity and trust, matters of integrity of the heart, integrity in our spiritual walk. In chapter 7, he talked about judging others and examining your own faults first and about being authentic. And by the way, if you're going, wow, I should have listened to some of those sermons, you still can. Go to calvarylhc.com, go to the sermon tab, and you can pull up any of those sermons and listen to them if you miss some. If you go, hey, I, I need to hear that again. I, I need to reflect on that. Then go back and listen. You see, a wise life begins when we pursue that authentic, life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's step one. Have you done that? Have you come to that place in your life where you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world? Do you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead? And have you surrendered your life to following Jesus? Have you committed yourself to him? Because that's the beginning point. If you haven't done that, it doesn't matter what else you do, you're missing out. Now, if you've done that, then you've got to add to that. You've got to take the words of Jesus and apply them to your life, which means you've got to have regular conversations with God. You've got to have discipline and sacrifice as part of your life. That's that whole self-denial thing. You've got to practice generosity and mercy and serving and purity. And then you've got to ask God to change your dreams. We live in a society where we've pretty much elevated 
the individual to uh, God status, right? And we tell people all the time, follow your dreams, follow your heart. Can I just tell you that those two statements are not biblical counsel that is ever given? Prophet Jeremiah said the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. So when people say, follow your heart, I go, no, don't do it. <laughs> Listen to Jesus, don't follow your heart. Look, my heart would have me weighing about 400 pounds and living on chocolate ice cream, okay? <laughs> uh, well, would, heart wouldn't last long if I did that. But anyway, that, yeah, that's just it. It's, it's not, our heart it doesn't lead us to that place. The world doesn't get it. Jesus says, look, Invite God to change your dreams, God to change your desires, God to change your heart, God to change your mind. He will lead you into his plan. This is where wisdom begins. This is the life of wisdom. It's saying, God, change me. Change my life, change my heart, change my mind. I want to be yours. So is your life crumbling from bitterness? Is your life shattered by lust? Is it broken because of greed and materialism and love for money? Is it empty simply because you neglect your soul? I mean, you might be a good person in other people's eyes, but is your soul starving because you're not connecting with God? You see, you can make a course correction. You can apply Jesus' words to your life. You can seek God. You can live your faith. And here's what happens. God will restore your soul as you begin to do that. But you have to get honest with yourself. You have to examine yourself. And you may need to go back and say, hey, I need to listen to some of those messages again. I need to download them and, and spend a week listening to the conversation about prayer or listening to the conversation about lust or listening to the conversation about forgiveness. See, a wise life begins by applying Jesus' words to ourselves. And then a wise life will apply Jesus' teachings to relationships. To your relationships. Uh, throughout the sermon, Jesus emphasizes relationships. He talks about the priority of reconciliation in chapter 5. He talks about faithfulness in your marriage. He talks about turning the other cheek, loving, even loving your enemies. It's about relationships. It's about your relationship with God and your relationship with people. And so I want you to know that Jesus teaches that a wise life is a life that values people. A wise life is one that values relationships. In other words, a wise life is one that says relationships are more important than being right. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we were talking about the one rule, treating others as you would want them to treat you. Some people call it the golden rule. You see, when we apply Jesus' teachings to our relationships, it turns them upside down. So I want you to think about your key relationships. If you're married, think about your spouse. If you have a significant other, think about them. Um, and, and, and just imagine how making them a, a priority Applying Jesus' teachings to your relationship are going to change that relationship with your spouse. Which means, husbands, what if you would stop wishing that your wife would change or stop wishing that you could change wives? Like there's some kind of, you know, hey, this one's broken. Can I take it back and get another one? And what if you just decided to love your wife as Christ intended? What if you decided that you were going to serve your wife? What if you decided you were going to be patient and kind toward her? What if you decided you were going to encourage and protect her? And that was going to be the, your goal when you got up in the morning. See, it would radically alter your relationships. It changed things. And a lot of the ladies are going, that's right, you tell them. <laughs> Look, I confess, my marriage improved dramatically when I stopped loving the, the woman I wanted Meralda to be and started loving the woman that she is. It's amazing how much better my marriage got, how much happier things were. And, and so instead of asking God to change her so that I would be happy, I asked, started asking God to change me so that I could love her the way that he intended. You see that dynamic, how that, that completely changes everything? Because most of us are, are selfish and we think, oh, if only this person would do this differently, then I'd be happy. 
Instead of saying, God, help me to be the spouse you want me to be. Help me to love them as they are and be thankful to you for who they are. Okay, I'm an equal opportunity offender. So ladies, what if you would trust God, actually trust God and dare to biblically submit to your husband? What if you started giving your husband respect and encouragement? It could turn the relationship upside down. Now, I'm not pretending this is easy, but it is wise. This is what Jesus teaches. Of course, we can continue just saying that we trust God, but living life our way and doing relationships our, on our terms and then wonder why when it fails. We can do that. But that's a house built on sand. And if we want to build our house on the rock, if we want to build our relationships on the rock, then, then we've got to listen to Jesus and we've got to apply when it's hard. And, and by the way, uh, I just observed this through the years as I've uh, walked with people through relationships. If we begin a relationship the wrong way, why are we surprised when it ends the wrong way? Uh, how about trusting God at the beginning of the relationship and doing things his way at the beginning of the relationship and seeing if that doesn't actually lead to a better result? Because I know it will. And uh, just for the record, if you started wrong and now you're following Jesus, then praise God for grace and uh, the fact that God redeems our lives and he's inviting you into a new way of relating. So even if you started wrong and Jesus is at the center of your relationship now, follow him. And apply what he says to your life and it will bless your relationships. And especially apply Jesus' teachings to your family. To your family. Uh, multiple times in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus reminds us that God is our Father. When he teaches us to pray, he says, pray to, your to God this way. Our Father which art in heaven. Later on, he talks about when you pray and you ask God for things, understand that he relates to you in a way that a father would to his children and give good, great gifts. Uh, that's the model relationship that God uses to teach us how he relates to us. And nowhere is the wisdom of God seen more clearly than when we build our families on God's word. Think about this. This has generational impact. So if you have children at home or you have direct influence on your grandkids, then you know the incredible responsibility that God has given you to influence their lives. You're an influencer. You're a leader in their lives. So build your family on God's wisdom. And, and that means, I don't know how else to put this, so uh, make God a priority. Make God a priority. I know some of you are like, well, we're in church, aren't we? Yes, thank you. I'm glad you're here. But um, parents, when everything else takes precedence over worship and serving, your children learn that God really isn't that important. I'm going to say that again. Parents, when everything else takes precedence over worship or serving God, your children learn that God really isn't all that important. And I know a lot of parents who say, hey, well, I want my children to grow up loving Jesus and, 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 and I want them to trust Christ because, let's face it, we want them to go to heaven. But once they get baptized, once they make that commitment to Jesus, once they say yes, then a lot of times it's like, okay, they're in, so now we don't have to make God a priority anymore. And, and, and I'm already offending people, so let me go ahead and just continue. Look, I love sports. I'm a sports nut. I love leagues. I love watching kids play. But if God is a lower priority than gymnastics or cheer or baseball or soccer or football, what kind of fruit's going to result? And, and look, I took my kids to Disneyland. I, they, they, look, we had to do the princess tour. I got daughters, man. I got pictures with every princess that was, there was at the time. Thankfully, uh, we didn't have as many as we do now. But... Uh, but we did Disneyland. We did the Southern California theme park tour uh, lots of times. Look, I, I like roller coasters as much as the next person. But I also took my kids on mission trips. I sent them to camps. Uh, see, you're the key influencer in their lives. You're teaching them which foundation they should build on. 
That's what we're doing as parents. We're showing them what it looks like. So parents, do your kids see you rejoice in your faith or complain about the church or complain about the pastor or complain about the people at the church? Do your children see an example of generosity in your life or selfishness in your life? Do you encourage or mandate your child's participation in the the youth group and in the camps? Because there's only so many life-changing opportunities that exist while they're still under your influence. You know what tragedy looks like? Unfortunately, I've seen it way too many times when a desperate parent shows up with their 13 or 14-year-old at church hoping someone can fix them. Truth is, we can't fix anyone. That's, that's God's job. And here at church, uh, honestly, as, as pastors, our influence is about one to two hours a week. Uh, except Unless you send them to camp, we've got a few extra hours in each year. But... Um, But that's not going to really correct a lifetime of foolish leadership. So please, because your kids' lives depend on it, build a wise family. Worship together, pray together, serve together, laugh together, play together. But keep God as the priority in your family. And it only happens if we apply God's word to our lives. Now, if you're panicking right now, if you're feeling like, oh, no, I've blown it, let me just remind you that that we follow a God of grace, a God who redeems, a God who restores, a God who can work miracles, and it's never too late to begin building your life on Jesus. Let me say that again. It is never too late to begin building your life on Jesus. And if you haven't been, then today is a great day to start a course correction and start asking for God to redeem. Will you pray with me? Father, we love you. We love you because you loved us first and you demonstrated that in Jesus because you were willing to sacrifice your son for us. You did the unthinkable so that we could be adopted into your family as children of God, joint heirs with Jesus, recipients of all of your grace, all of your goodness, all of your power, all of your wealth. Not because we're good, but because you're good and because of your grace. And so tonight we want to thank you. We want to praise you, but we also want to surrender to you because you know our foolishness. You know our brokenness. You know our choices that lead to destruction. And and we want to give ourselves to Jesus again. So meet us in this place. Let your comfort be real. Let your grace flow. And help us to live lives of wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.